Hi there, thanks for being with us today. My name is Carmina. I'll be your host for today's presentation, Everything High Frequency Circuit Designers Need to Know About Stability Analysis. Matt, welcome, you now have the floor. Thank you, Carmina. Um, all right, let's see, I should be able to switch to this slide. Yeah, so today, um, as Carmina mentioned, there's, there's a lot of different material out there. We've, um, we've done a webcast about stability analysis. I have um, videos as well out there. So today I'm gonna try to give you uh, an overview, and I have a couple live demos, which are, are new. I'm going to do them completely live. Um, so there's some material in there you haven't seen before. So I'm going to give kind of an overview of the the content that I have in the videos, and um, and then we'll get to the live demos hopefully with enough time to go to go through them. So uh, as always, feel free to type questions in the chat. Um, when we start out talking about stability analysis, at least if you're a high frequency designer, uh, the first place everyone tends to go is K factor. And um, K-Factors, I mean, it's a great metric. I've used it um, quite a bit in my own uh, hardware design uh, career. But, you know, when you, when you start digging into K-Factor, there's a few, a few issues with it. And I, I talk about these in a little more detail in, in my uh, YouTube video. But the, the main issue I think that you'll run into with K-Factor, at least as far as accuracy is concerned, is it's based on, on a, an assumption that was sort of an afterthought when it was originally written. This was um, this paper by Rollett. This is a, a measurement technique. There wasn't much simulation stuff out there uh, at the time. So the, the, the condition really was that um, stability factor is valid when the, the open network or the, the ideally terminated network, um, which means op terminated with an open and short, is stable by itself. And that is the assumption that underlies everything about K-factor. Uh, back in the 1990s, I've got a paper here uh, by Struble and Platzker who were able to demonstrate a ring oscillator that has a super stable K-factor and yet was completely unstable, um, shown by their other metric, the normalized determinant function. So um, the problem with K-factor is you can't always rely on it. There's a few other issues there as well. Um, so then engineers tend to, to want to look at different approaches to use for stability. And at least I, I can speak from personal experience. You know, the first time uh, I started looking at all these different approaches. It seemed like this really tangled web of, of different techniques and, and things, and, and all of them seemed like they, they could be accurate in certain cases and maybe inaccurate in other cases. And I was just really left uh, confused. So my hope with the videos and this webcast and everything else that I'm presenting is to try to help you untangle all of this and actually start using these things as tools and not just trying to figure out what they even mean. Um, and what I'm going to show you is a, a capability that we've put into our design tool, Advanced Design System. And these things are called WS probes. They're named after their inventor, uh, Tom Winslow, Dr. Tom Winslow. He's a technical fellow at Maycom. And he's developed this probe that essentially uh, allows you to access all of these techniques from just one simulation. So some of what I'm going to do today is just show you the different techniques, um, how, you, how you use them, and then... Um, you can derive them all just based on post-processing uh, using the probe. Um, and, and again, this is, this is a brief overview. Um, I think I've got over an hour of content up on YouTube. I've got a seven-part series. And in fact, I just made a new video for, um, for the new release of ADS because there's a new technique in there. I'll talk about that today, too. Um, but, but if you want more information, this is going to be a little bit more high level. Um, you can watch the YouTube series. You can pause it. You can rewind it. Um, there, there, it's pretty extensive amount of uh, technical information in there. Um, okay, so this is the agenda for today. We had the introduction. I'm going to go through a background, just talk a little bit about um, some of the basic concepts and stability. We'll talk about some common techniques. So we'll talk about loop gain. Um, there's multiple ways to do loop gain. We'll talk about some, some of Bodhi's work, um, return ratio and driving point in minutes. And we'll talk about some modern implementations, you know, normalized determinant network bifurcation. Um, and then I'll introduce you to this probe, which allows you to really unify all of these techniques. Um, and then hopefully I can, I'm going to try to cover this, um, you know, in about 30 or 40 minutes. And then we'll have some time for the live demo. So I'm just going to show you uh, how the probes work and go through a couple um, common things I've seen people run into. Okay, so before we get started, um, we have a poll question here. We've never done this before, so hopefully, um, hopefully I, can, I can do this correctly. So the question is, why might K-factor sometimes prove inaccurate? Is it uh, that it doesn't consider the network determinant? Um, is it that it's based on the assumption that the unloaded network is stable? Uh, is it that simulations don't always have enough sweep points to determine if it goes below one? Um, does it only apply to, to one stage amplifier or all of the above? So if you could take a minute to, uh, to fill in the poll question. Um, and then Carmina, am I allowed to, should I talk about the answer or should we wait? 
I don't know how this works. <laughs> you can talk about the answer. You can do whatever you want, Matt. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm in charge. <laughs> that's a that's a first. Um, okay. So, all right. Well, I'll give you I'll give you a minute to think about it. And um, so, all of these all of these people. I'm actually going to walk through each of them. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, the network determinant is actually um, a consideration in the stability factor. It's it's called the stability measure. It's another thing that you need to to look at when you're considering the the network determinant. Uh, the correct answer is that it's based on the assumption that the unloaded network is stable. Um, the sweep points, yeah, if you don't have enough sweep points, you can certainly miss a uh, uh, high Q oscillation. So I've seen that happen before, but it's not a problem, which is K factor that can happen for anything. And it only applies to one stage of an amplifier. Actually, K factor only applies to an extern the external parts of an amplifier. So like the source and load terminations. All right, so there you go. Um, all right, everybody, it looks like most people got the right answer. So that's well, some people picked all of the above, which I, I can see it was a little confusing, um, but uh, those are the results. Cool. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about what makes a, a system unstable. Uh, so, you know, you can crack open your old college circuits textbook. Mine is Cedron Smith, by the way, and I, I think I can find the page in Cedron Smith. I've got it bookmarked now, um, where, you know, stabilities and instabilities really arise from these gain feedback systems. This is the most basic view of of instability. And essentially, we can take a look at a gain feedback system. We can derive a transfer function that looks really simply like what I'm showing here. And the bottom term, that AF term, is called the loop gain. So of course, when the loop gain gets to be 1, the denominator goes to 0. The closed loop gain, the transfer function goes to infinity. And we have an oscillation. So that's that's kind of the simplified, most basic view of oscillation that we can we can get. I uh, just want to dive into this a little more detail. I'm actually going to show you this in one of my demos later today. Um, but the, the transfer function is, is really an S domain equation, of course. And um, you may need to go back and, and recall that the, um, you know, we can, we can, of course, break these up into poles and zeros. We can, we can decompose this type of a transfer function into norm, numerator zeros and denominator poles. And if you look at the, the Laplace transform um, for this type of, of function, it comes into an exponential in the time domain. So the exponential in the time domain is really the key thing to, to um, make something oscillate. And it turns out that, you know, if you have an exponential, of course, you can have a positive or negative signed exponential in the time domain. And it's good to have a negative signed exponential because these decay versus time. If you have one with a positive side, everybody knows that uh, they grow. So these things uh, map to what's called the right half uh, S plane, and those produce growing exponentials. So if you're an amplifier designer, you do not want to be anywhere near the, the right half plane with your designs. OK, so now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about loop gain here. How do you how do you find loop gain? And I'm just going to do a really basic um, derivation because there's there's lots of ways to find loop gain. But in essence, uh, you, you do something like this. You first you divide the circuit. Right. So we, we need an amplifier and a feedback block. And so I'm making the transistor the amplifier. And by definition, I, I think a lot of times people might think, well, th these two components, the L and the C are the feedback. But in reality, if you have a two block uh, system and you're gonna designate one block the amplifier, then everything else is the feedback, including, by the way, the input and output terminations here. So, um, so from there, we break the loop somewhere between the amplifier and feedback. And we, we somehow stimulate uh, one side of it, perhaps with a, a voltage, and we observe what comes back to the other side. And that, that thing that's returned to the other side is then the product of the, the input signal and the the gain function and the uh, feedback as well, which is the loop gain. And there's a couple of different ways to look at this. Um, probably the most most common uh, way to look at it, especially with like op amp designs at low frequencies, is to do a Bode plot. Uh, you just look at the magnitude and, and phase, uh, and you look for places where the the loop gain is high and the phase shift is 180 because you'll get a constructive feedback on the input. Um, alternatively, you can look at what's called the Nyquist plot. You can plot the loop gain and you can observe encirclements around either zero or one, depending on if you're looking at the loop gain by itself, then you want to look at one. Or if you're looking at the whole denominator of the transfer function, you want to look at zero. And you can uh, count the number of encirclements and derive something. This is based on Cauchy's principal argument. You can actually derive the difference between the right half plane zeros and the right half plane poles. So really what we want to get at is the right half plane poles. But the problem with Cauchy's principle and with loop gain is that we only get the difference. So if you have two zeros and two poles, you won't see any encirclements. Um, and that's, that's fundamentally why uh, loop gain is not uh, necessarily a rigorous metric. So 
Uh, there's there's lots of different techniques to do loop gain. In, in one of the videos, I walk through all of these different techniques. And when you do that, you start to see that, you know, these techniques, they all have their own assumptions. Um, they come in, wh which direction does the signal flow? Uh, some loop gain techniques, uh, in the ideal sense, right, it, it comes forward through the amplifier and backward through the feedback. But we've all, you know, those of us who have worked with real transistors and real circuits, we all know that, like, transistor has a, an S12 term. So certainly a signal could feed back through the amplifier as well. And certainly it could feed forward through the feedback. I mean, we build power amplifiers that are feed forward amplifiers that we specifically try to inject the signal into the forward path. So um, so we have these different techniques. Middlebrook, which is a unilateral approach. Um, also that wherever you break the loop, you've got to terminate it with something. And that can mean that based on where you break it, you can have different sensitivities. So, so Middlebrook is, is pretty good because it's insensitive to impedance. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Michael Tian um, created a, a bilateral version that considers signal flow in both directions. Um, there's also a loop gain by Hearst that I cover in the videos and one called OSTEST, which is a classic oscillator technique. Um, that's where you use a circulator and you actually inject the signal with a circulator and observe the return. And I plotted all of these techniques. I took, I took that circuit that I showed you in the other um, the other slide where I just have a transistor and some other stuff. And um, I plotted all these techniques. And the thing to note is that they all give different results. And it's, it can be confusing, especially some of them will disagree on whether the circuit's stable or not. So, um, and that's all ba because of these different assumptions. Um, so to really understand, so, so we're left with K factor not being rigorous. I, I talked about that. Um, loop gain, it's not rigorous. We've got assumptions. We only know the difference between the zeros and poles. There's also issues with breaking up the amplifier and feedback that I haven't, had, um, haven't talked about. But we return to these fundamental concepts. So when we, when we search for a rigorous technique to, to look at stability, um, ultimately you come back to, to Heinrich Bode's work from the 1940s. Um, and so I boiled this whole tangled web back to these two fundamental concepts. And what's interesting about the book, I, I highly recommend reading this book, uh, Network Analysis and Feedback Amplifier Design. It's still totally readable and relevant today. Um, but it actually, the, the loop gain stuff that I just showed you, it predates uh, this work. It was from, actually um, developed in the 1920s by uh, Harold Black. And so, you know, these loop gain techniques were actually around when Bodhi came up with these fundamental measures. And in fact, his whole, his whole reason for, for doing this work was to develop this general definition of feedback because basically what he, and I highlighted this part here in the book, um, the other ways are ambiguous and uncertain. These loop gain techniques have so many ambiguities and uncertainties um, that we, we can't be sure that we're actually stable. So Bodhi's whole goal with this work was to um, determine a more general definition that would allow us to have rigor that loop gain uh, lacked. And here, by the way, here, the, these, these two terms, um, um, the beta term and the, the other term here are the mu term are um, the gain and feedback terms that he's referring to. You can see them in the, in the little feedback network there. So uh, if you read the book, he, you know, Bodhi basically defined two different views of a network. Um, the the right-hand side is the one that I've just covered. That's a, that's a gain feedback system. Um, these are all vacuum tubes, by the way. And uh, on the left-hand side, he, he also presented the view of um, a network as a set of nodal equations where you can solve for the steady state response of any of these, these nodes. And for each of these different views of a network, he came up with a different fundamental measure of stability. So for the nodal equations, we have driving point impedance or admittance. And for the feedback system, we have return difference. And so I just wanted to briefly go through. I, I put the on the right hand side of this, I put the um, the pages from these are actually in two different chapters in his book. Um, I'm going to go the reverse order that he did um, and talk about them. So we'll start with the the network view of gain feedback system because I just covered that with loop gain in the last section. So return difference and return ratio. He defined these as really the those ideal loop gain terms. These these have parallels to the loop gain that I described, but they're done at the intrinsic um, ideal current source or gener you know, gain element, transconductance element that's buried inside your transistor. Now this isn't, or your, your vacuum tube. This isn't a real thing. Um, this is an imaginary thing. But if you go to the active source, um, you can actually compute this type of a loop gain around it. And even better than that, uh, what Bodhi did was define it mathematically in terms of network determinants. It, it turns out that's, that's actually a more useful definition than the way to do it with a circuit. So he defined it as um, this return difference, which is the, like the transfer function denominator, 
as the determinant, the network determinant, um, divided by the same network determinant with the active elements removed from the matrix. And so what does this mean? Well, if you think about Cauchy's principle, um, and I didn't, I didn't touch on it too, too much, but Cauchy's principle, we talk about, we only know, um, we're looking at encirclements that only gives us the difference between the right half plane zeros and poles, right? Well, Bodhi, I mean, yeah, Bodhi in, in, in this work, he guarantees a stable denominator. So he basically is looking at encirclements and he's searching for, I mean, if you're looking at the denominator, you'd search for zeros. If you're looking at the transfer function, you search for poles, but he's looking for only one of those things because he zeros out the other term. That's the key piece of this. And that's what makes it rigorous. That's why you can, you can look at um, encirclements of a return difference function and know that those are the right half plane um, elements that you're looking for, as opposed to loop gain where you can never be sure. Uh, similarly, he had a, a thing called return ratio. That's a, a parallel to the to the loop gain that we talked about earlier. The only confusing thing is that there's a negative sign underlined uh, on the right hand side, the negative sign, which has caused, um, including a lot of engineers, including myself, it has caused us uh, lots of confusion <laughs> when we're when we're doing various derivations and plots. Um, so we got to be careful about the negative sign. Uh, the other term that uh, that Bodhi coined was this driving point impedance or a minute. So if you look at a network like a series of, of um, nodes or meshes, you can come up with a set of equations that describes the steady state response. And the way you can kind of look at it is like the rest of the, so you have some given node on a circuit, say there's an, an impedance in your circuit or whatever. The rest of the circuit can be can be looked at as a separate block and it's driving that one node that you're analyzing. So maybe it stimulates it with a current and then the node that you're looking at is going to produce a voltage in response to that stimulus. So that term is called the driving point impedance. And, and you can, of course, invert impedance to make admittance. That's, that's easy. It's just one over the driving point impedance. Um, and he defined it similarly with you know, rigorous mathematical terms as the network determinant um, divided by the same network with, uh, determinant where you, but you remove the, the node under consideration. You remove the row and the column. That's what that little um, KK underneath means. It means row and the column terms and the node you're analyzing are removed from the matrix. So, um, so we have a, we have a, glo a sort of a global level function uh, start and a local uh, function where you can analyze a node or you can analyze an entire network. That's the value of having these two different views in the first place. Uh, so I, I wanted to just briefly cover, I talk about this more in the videos as well, um, and by the way, the workspace, a lot of the stuff that I'm showing here, it's available for you to download from the YouTube channel. Um, you can go download it and, and try out these simulations. So if you want to compute the return difference, um, it's actually pretty, pretty easy to do. I show two ways in the video, but the determinant based way is to go in and you basically put these high impedance probes. So you don't want to load down the circuit. Um, if you're dealing with a current source, you do it a little differently. But in this case, you would, you would go in with high impedance probes and we're going to basically derive the network, the, the Y matrix across this, um, this transconductance element. And then we take the determinant of it. We can convert that in the simulation to a, to an, a Y parameter. This is going to come out as an S parameter. And then we simply take the determinant of that matrix and normalize it by the determinant of the case where we, we turn this off. So we're going to, I actually, in the simulation, we'll go in and I switch off this current source. I set it to zero. Now it doesn't need to be zero. You can set it to any constant as long as it's not an AC. Um, source, but uh, zero is pretty convenient. So I go in and set this thing to zero and I can turn this element completely off. You can't do that in every, every device out there. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, driving point admittance, I showed how to calculate this uh, using determinants, but probably the most useful way to compute it is actually with this thing called an auxiliary generator. Um, if anyone uses like the stand tool, you, this is kind of a similar method to observe this. The, the driving point um, impedance is the input to the to the stand tool. So essentially, you can you can drive that node with a like a current signal, and you observe a voltage on that node, um, and that will allow you to de derive the driving point admittance. Now, doing it in a measurement is a lot harder. The simulation just happens to be this happens to be a really convenient way to doing this in simulation. So um, you can you you don't need other tools to figure out whether your your um, your response is stable or unstable, you can actually use Kurokawa's oscillation condition. Talk about that a little bit in the videos as well. Um, essentially, instead of looking at the um, impedance, you can look at the admittance. So you invert the impedance. And the reason you invert the impedance is because um, it's much easier to detect, detect zero than it is to detect infinity. And that's really what you're looking for, that case where the impedance is infinite. 
and it's it's either act it's not responding uh, or it's acting like a generator. So so you can find that um, in Kurokawa's case, and we look at both the real and imaginary parts to find Kurokawa's um, oscillator. This is a classic oscillator condition. Um, so the real part is less than or equal to zero, and the imaginary part is equal to zero, crossing it uh, positively with respect to frequency. So there's a little bit there to unpack, but the way I, I tend to think about it, it may be an oversimplification the way I think about it, um, but I think about it like, well, you know, if you have stored energy, you can't, you can't be certain that there's, a, there's an oscillation starting up. So what we're really talking about with Kurokawa's condition is an autonomous oscillation. That's important. An oscillation that will just start up by itself. It doesn't need any external stimulus uh, to start it up. Okay, I, I'm going to move on now to some modern extensions of Bode's work. So Bode's work was done in the 1940s. Um, it's based on like one one vacuum tube, right? So today, you if you have a, a circuit, usually you've got multiple active sources. Um, in fact, in, in your transistors, you probably have um, multiple transistor models. You have multiple active sources, and then you have multiple transistors uh, in a modern circuit. So um, Wayne Struble and Ariel Plasker came up with this extension of Bode's original return ratio concept to allow it to account for multiple sources. Basically, um, he showed that you can set all of these, and what you need to do is expand the matrix to account for these sources. And he was, they were basically able to show that, you know, you, could, you can do this one at a time as a return ratio, but you can also sort of do it all at the same time if you set everything constant, because if you set all of your sources to, to a constant, um, you know, if you have n sources in the network, then the denominator will still be stable for that overall um, function. So I made a little more of a complex, you know, doing, if you have one um, active device, the normalized determinant and the, the return ratio are the same, essentially the same thing. So I made two transistors, I made an amplifier with two different transistors, and I had a feedback block. And it, I'm not sure how well you can, hopefully you can see it on the slides, but I actually went into those transconductances and I applied the high impedance terminations to all of those uh, four per terminals of the transconductance. And then, um, you know, before I had a four by four matrix, because there were four, now I have eight terminals because there's two transistors, but I did the exact same procedure. I just swept them, um, turned them on, turned them off, computed the network determinant, and that's the normalized determinant function. And I'm observing the encirclements of the origin for the normalized determinant function. So if you're using ADS, you can do it in like four equations or less to get the normalized determinant function. Uh, there's another method that I wanted to talk about. I haven't covered this too much in, in a lot of my prior presentations, but this is uh, something I've sort of recently been introduced to by, uh, by Dr. Winslow, and it's, it's kind of an exciting thing, um, which is this, this concept of network bifurcation. So, um, you know, again, it's all about getting a stable, um, stable piece of the network that we can analyze. And so there was a paper, um, I, I did, a lot of people that, you know, haven't read it because it's, it, it's kind of, it can be a little tedious to, to implement the method, but essentially um, it was paper by Atomo. I've got the reference. Um, you, can, you can bifurcate a, a, a circuit into active and passive blocks. And as long as each active and uh, each of the two blocks is individually stable. Now, if you're using a, a crazy, um, you know, 200 finger FET, uh, that's just massive, then it's probably not a great assumption. But if you're using um, FETs from, you know, well-known vendors that are relatively well-behaved, you know, if you bifurcate at the at the device input, that's a fairly um, safe assumption, then you don't need to go into the current generator. Uh, you can actually just apply the bifurcation externally uh, without losing any of the rigor. And essentially what you do is you observe all of these interface nodes and you successively inject a signal into, through a circulator into each interface node and you, you do it in an iterative manner, so you put isolators on some of the other nodes as you walk through it. And you compute a family of, of loop gain, essentially loop gain curves. And when you observe the encirclements of those loop gain term, uh, curves, it turns out that you can get a global um, rigorous analysis of stability similar to normalized determinant without needing to go through uh, into the internal device and turn everything off. So um, this is the same circuit I showed for normalized determinant function. And um, so how do you compute Atomo's loop gain on this type of a circuit? Well, I, I would, of course, bifurcate the active devices. This is one of the S blocks. And everything else is passive. So that's the passive block. So the red is active. Um, blue is passive. And then there's four interconnects in this case. Um, this is sort of an idealized case. But there's four different interconnects here. And I walk through. So I basically create four different copies of the circuit. Or I, I can run four different simulations, too. That's fine. 
Um, and I start here, I put a circulator with termination in here and I inject the signal in and I observe the response at the other side of the circulator. Um, then I move to the second node. I replace that original circulator with an isolator on, on the input port. I inject the signal, do the same thing. I go to the third node. I, re I replace those two with isolators pointing back at the devices, et cetera. And I compute four different loop gains, which I can observe an encirclement then um, of, the, of the, um, the one zero term because it's a loop gain. So, um, so I've got four, I, I showed you a couple of different techniques here. Um, common techniques like loop gain and, and K factor are useful, but they're not super rigorous. Um, rigorous stability analysis, I showed you that in this section, you can, you can do it like this. Uh, you can compute driving point admittance, but it's only gonna apply to the node you're currently analyzing. So if you have a hundred nodes, um, you know, and you're looking at one, you can determine if that node's stable, but not if everything's stable. Um, internally referenced, that's, that's pretty important. Return ratio or normalized determinant function can give you a global rigorous view of stability, but you must, uh, for normalized determinant and return ratio, you technically, you need to be able to either access the internal generator or at the very least be able to turn it off, which with foundry models can be pretty challenging. Um, network bifurcation with Atomo's method is good, but the individual blocks must be stable. Also, you, you probably could get a feel for when I showed you that technique it's awfully tedious in a real life circuit. You know, you might have a hundred interface nodes in a real life circuit. Then you have to repeat that process, that iterative process a hundred times, which frankly is why not a lot of people um, use it or have heard of it before. Um, so when you look at all these techniques, you kind of are left with pros and cons for everyone. Like there's no clear technique that's perfect in every scenario. So um, I'd like to offer a, a more practical suggestion here, which is why do you need to use one technique? Uh, actually, I'm gonna show you in some of the demos, these techniques are, are pretty useful when you use them in combination because it's kind of like different ways of looking at the same problem. Um, sometimes I think about it like plumbing. You know, I, uh, if you've got a leak, a plumbing leak or something, you, you don't just go into the, um, you know, under your sink with like a screwdriver. You know, you need tools. You need a, a toolbox. And if you've got a flashlight and, and if you have wrenches, set of wrenches, these are all good things to help you solve a problem. Um, and that's the same way with these, uh, these stability analysis tools. So they can be quite complementary when used together. And I'll try to show you how that works. But the first problem, actually, when you're trying to use all these techniques is like they're just so tedious to set up. Um, here is a couple of the loop gains that I, I haven't really covered in detail, NDF. Everything requires a completely different setup. And I think the practical reason that a lot of people haven't looked at this uh, too much is because it's just there's no way, you know, no real way to do this on a circuit. You would need to generate, you know, a massive workspace and, and all that. Um, so what Tom, Tom Winslow was able to contribute was, you know, if you look at the common theme for all of these, it, it really comes down to the admins network matrix. Talk about that a little more in the videos. Uh, so Tom derived a, a probe that, that, and I want to be clear, unlike previous probes that were kind of similar to this, um, this probe returns bidirectional impedances and admittances which are accurate even under the presence of feedback. So some of the previous probes that were out there, like the S probe, um, are useful, but you'll find under feedback that they break down. They don't give accurate results. And I just showed you that, that stability problems arise from gain in feedback. So if you can't analyze the impedances in the presence of feedback, it's not very useful. Um, a probe isn't very useful. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit now about just how do you, you know, how does this probe work? Um, essentially, I, I have that amplifier feedback example that I've been using the whole time. I put a set of probes at the input and output, and from that, I can essentially derive all of these different stability metrics here. And it's not just the ones I'm showing, by the way. These are, these are the, some ones that I've covered manually, so um, let me just walk through them. So we'll start out. This is an OS test loop gain, so I would insert a component. It's basically a circulator, but you can find it in, in any design tool. Um, it injects a signal, observes the return. Well, for the probes, we can, we can actually uh, just run two sets of equations in the probe results, and we can, we can do this on virtually apply this to any node we want. And what I'm showing here is the red curve is from this WS probe, and the blue curve is from the, an original simulation that I did that looks like what you see on the left. So these two are equal. Um, you can also do this Middlebrook loop gain. The Middlebrook's loop gain has uh, voltage and current uh, injection and essentially you run, you do a bunch of equations. Well, based on the probe outputs, we can compute that with one equation. Um, we can run a Hurst style loop gain that bifurcates, that actually breaks the feedback and amplifier uh, and computes two separate uh, Y parameter networks for those and then combines them in parallel. Uh, you can also do TN's bilateral loop gain. Personally, I think this is the most useful loop gain because it's, 
based on the injection. So it's not sensitive to the loop and, uh, you know, the location in the loop. And it's also bilateral. So it considers signal flow in both directions. We can derive that directly from the probe example. Um, we can we can run a normalized determinant function because we can derive a Y matrix from any number of probes in there and simply toggle the source and take the determinant. And we can also do the driving point at minutes that's directly output by the probe as well. And finally, I, I should mention, um, this is new in ADS 2021. We can also do a TOMO's bifurcation analysis. So essentially we set up the probes to point um, in towards the active devices consistently. So either the gate or the, or sorry, the generator or the load side would point into the active network. And then you essentially run the probe network through this equation and it'll derive these Atomo style family of loop gains based on all your probes. And this is just matching the result that I showed from earlier where I bifurcated the network and I added circulators and isolators to all the nodes quite painstakingly. I can match those results by just sticking probes um, properly configured into that same network and running it through this set of equations. So it'll virtually bifurcate the network. It'll virtually apply the isolators and circulators and compute an accurate result for you. Um, Finally, the, the analysis is trivial to extend to large signal. So basically, um, when you're running a harmonic balance simulation, you can double click on it. Um, you check a box that says perform stability analysis and you're all set. And so I'm just showing a couple. Um, this is an example of how, I guess, how hard it is or how tedious it is to do a, a basic um, large signal analysis where, when it's easy to just do it with the probes. Okay, so my goal was to kind of just walk you briefly. I know some people have already seen the content and I wanna keep it uh, interesting. So my goal was to, to kind of just walk you through at a high level these different techniques. If you didn't get everything in the last section, um, you know, I kind of went through it at a high level and pretty quickly. Um, go watch the YouTube videos because there's tons of detail in those. I go through like all a lot of the, the derivations on how, like how do you do this loop gain? You know, first you put a source in here and how exactly to do it. Uh, that's all in the, the videos and the workspace that I provided. But I, I wanted to get here because this is, at least for me, this is the most fun part, which is doing a couple of live demos, talking about some, some challenges that I've seen uh, from people in the industry um, when they're trying to use the probes. So I thought I'd show some of that. Um, and I also wanted to, there, there's been a lot of questions like, why do you need the probes if you have K-factor? Um, so, so I'd show that. And then secondly, I'll show you a um, kind of a neat technique uh, that I came up with to use uh, electromagnetic analysis in a pretty interesting way to get um, to like visually see where your coupling is that's that's giving you um, loop problems. All right, so um, this is a common question I get a lot, and I, I wanted to show this. So a lot of times when people are just starting out with the the probes, they they start they, they're like they have this question. They, you know, they send me a question that's something like, "Why aren't these probes detect detecting this obvious case where?" where the uh, circuit is, you know, unstable. And so I want to I want to talk about that a little bit. And, it, um, you know, I, I think people tend to think, well, the probes aren't giving me a consistent result with K factor when in reality, um, in reality, they are. So I built this workspace yesterday. Um, and so I've got a, I've got a transistor. I, I, a lot of people, if you're going to validate the probe, the first thing you do, you take some transistor model, you run a bias T on it, you put a couple of the probes in and you run like a really basic, you know, S parameter simulation. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe you you look at S22 or S11 versus frequency and you say, oh, my gosh, you know, one of these S22s is positive and everyone who I've ever met, you know, if, if you're an RF engineer, or microwave engineer and you see a positive S11 or S22, you know that that's bad. Um, and, and it, you know, it, I was a, I used to be an engineering manager and I I remember sitting in design reviews. And if anyone ever showed me a positive um, positive reflective as parameter, I would never let them um, go and do the design. So this is this is something that if you're an RF engineer, you just have red flags all over the place. Um, and then so someone has this, they have a K factor analysis. They say, look, it's outside of the Smith chart. You know, here is this. This is S22. It's it's outside of the Smith chart for all these low frequencies. K factor is low. Um, you know, the stability measure is coming up in that area too. So, um, but but now let's look at what the probes gave me. Um, First, loop gain. So I'm looking at loop gain from the probes. There's nothing here. It's minus 300, or, or some people like to look at it. Um, this is kind of the Bode plot style where you just look at dBs. Um, over here is the Nyquist plot, and you're, you're looking for a, a response that's going to circle something, and you get nothing. There's just a dot on there. So so they, they're kind of left screen their head. He's like, I know that the K factor here is is unstable, but this this probe is showing me nothing. Well. 
Uh, I want to point out something that I guess it may be obvious, but but I think um, a lot of times it gets missed, which is we're looking at loop gain from the probe. So basically, you zoom into this probe. The loop gain is essentially you inject a signal out here. It goes through the world, and something else comes back into this side. And that's what a loop gain measurement is. And when you look at a trivial circuit like this, it's just a transistor um, with bias T's. There's no loops. You have to be able to trace a loop that goes from the output back to the input. And uh, because we're in the simulation in this ideal case, we have blocks uh, through the bias networks. We have this ideal triangle for ground, which I've, I've never been able to build that in real life. Um, and that, there's just no way for the signal to couple back. So loop gain analysis is actually uh, quite useless in this, in this paradigm. So the, the second uh, thing people may look at is, is driving point minutes. Driving point minutes. Remember, I told you, well, that's such a rigorous measure. But they look at it and they see, well, the driving point in minutes, there's no Kurokawa conditions being detected from these probe uh, driving point in minutes. Is therefore, this thing looks stable. It's it's. Um, and and my hope is that if you if this happens to you, I, I hope you don't give up here and say, well, the probe isn't useful because actually um, it's it's quite useful. But you have to know how to think about uh, these different metrics. So because this was a device that, that, I'm, that I've made, I can go in and, and share with you um, a little bit more information. So I, I actually went into the device. I've got the parasitics. Some of the parasitics here are, are pulled out, like this might be a package uh, level at a device. And I was able to put probes in here as well. So I went in and put probes inside the device. And when you put probes inside the device, um, not surprisingly, you see a little bit better of a result. Here's some loop gains. They go up. We could probably look at these. But still, you know, even internally, the driving point admittance is not detecting any stabilities. And, and in fact, if you look at this loop gain internally, you still won't see any stabilities um, detected by this loop, you know, instabilities detected by this loop gain either. So the next thing I, I did is, because I, I am able to go in with this device model, is I'm going to run a normalized determinant function. So I, I've looked at a, a, um, you know, a rigorous measure. I've looked at loop gain, and I've looked at the K factor. Now I can look at the normalized determinant function using these probes. And the way I implemented that in the model was I, I just made a switch. So I've got a, I pass a parameter in here, and I set the beta and alpha factors based on that parameter. If it's one, then I set them to the values that they normally are. If it's zero, I set them to zero. I turn them off. And the, the other thing you should know if you're attempting a normalized determinant function uh, computation is that you need to preserve the DC condition. So I've got a DC thing on here that basically does the opposite. When this device is, is on, this device is off. And when it's off, this device is on. So it preserves the DC bias current. So that's, this is the little source on toggle that I have that I pass in. And I'm going to sweep that. I'm just going to turn it off and turn it on. And so what I can do now is look at the normalized determinant function. So we might, this is like um, if you're a lawyer and you appeal a case, <laughs> this is like appealing uh, your case and saying, well, wait a minute, this, is, um, this thing should be unstable, right? Well, we look at the normalized determinant function encirclements. And lo and behold, this amplifier still appears to be stable. Um, and here's the gain, by the way. You can see the gain is oh, for the off state is off, and for the on state it's on. And the S22 in the off state is inside the Smith chart. So what I'm basically showing you is, yes, I've truly turned this device off. It really is um, a stable denominator here. And yet I'm not seeing the encirclements that I expect to see. Um, OK, so we'll appeal it again. <laughs> Let's go to uh, another case, which is the, a transient simulation, because I think that can shed some light on, uh, on what may be going on here. So I will X out these S parameters. And I'm going to run a transient simulation and basically try to detect some of that oscillation that I thought I'd see with the positive S22 and K factor. And lo and behold, in my transient simulation, so what do I do? I, I, I step the input up, basically just put a step function in the input. And uh, at the output, this is the response at the drain node. And you can see, ah, I do have an oscillation here. I do have something ringing. But if you go, remember back to my slide that I talked about with the left half plane and the right half plane, you'll quickly identify that this ringing is decaying to zero. This ringing is in, this is a, this is an instability, but it's existing in the left half plane. So this will decay to zero. And I can also detect that, of course, in the frequency domain and show you that, you know, it's somewhere around where that negative uh, value was. So I, I, I want to make this point because it's really important. You could have a, you know, an S11 or an S22 that's outside of the Smith chart and still technically not have a self-sustaining, self-starting oscillation. 
Now, I'm not, I'm not sitting here telling you that there's a good idea to design that. In fact, I, I, I think it's a horrible idea to design a circuit that does this sort of thing. I'm simply pointing out that the metrics that you're deriving, that the, the rigorous metrics you're deriving from this probe are designed to detect, um, detect self-sustaining right half plane uh, poles in your transfer function. This is not one of those poles. Technically, this circuit is stable. The rigorous metrics are right here. At least in this particular case, um, the K factor, if you look at K factor, if you look at the S22 and you conclude that it's unstable, you're, you're wrong about that, um, at least from the sense in right half plane definition of stability. Now, ringing like this isn't good. I, I'm not suggesting you design an amplifier like that. As some of you, if you try to do this, you might get fired anyway if you try to design a, an amplifier that has this kind of ringing. But um, so, so that's, that's really the, the source of the difference, the disagreement between the, uh, the, the terms that are coming out of the probe and the K factor. And so now I want, well, let me first, before I, before I talk a little more about that disagreement, um, let, me, let me just add some feedback here. And so this, this circuit, it's not too hard to make it oscillate. Um, so I'm going to add some feedback, and I want to go back to my, you know, back to my original, um, original S parameter analysis. So I'll add a little bit of feedback. I think just about any feedback. Oop, I have to undo my termination here. Just about any feedback will do on this um, to make it unstable. And I'm going to go back to my basic stuff. Uh, and you know, so I still see that bad, the bad stuff happening at low frequencies. I see a spike at, at high frequencies too um, in these. And now if you start looking at these driving point admittances, you see, aha, there is, a, there is an oscillation detected. There is a Kurokawa's oscillation condition detected at these higher frequencies. So I, I, and what, the reason I'm really doing this is I want to I walk you back to that earlier transient simulation. I showed you a, a transient simulation where we essentially had a left half um, oscillation. And so now what I want to do is show you a transient simulation with a right half plane oscillation. So I'm going to... We're detecting higher frequencies. Transient, by the way, is a great way to validate um, instabilities. You will see instabilities with transient simulations. You have to be a little bit careful because um, you kind of have to know where to look. Uh, I'm changing the time scale here. I'm going from the megahertz up into the, um, the gigahertz. And so, so it's, it's the time scale is a little different. Sometimes when in a transient simulation, if you have a growing oscillation, it won't converge because you have exponential growth. And at some point, oops trying to run an S parameter simulation. I thought it wasn't converging right there. Um, you know, at some point it'll, it'll just won't be able to converge. So now let's look at this transient result of the right half plane pull term. Now this, remember that the driving point in minutes is the one that told us that this right half plane pull, uh, pull term was there too. You can trust me that the normalized determinant function agrees. Um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it agrees very well with the, um, the driving point uh, in minutes Kurokawa computation. And now you can see this oscillation happening. And actually, you can see both the low frequency envelope here, that's the lower frequency decaying oscillation, and the higher frequency sustained oscillation. In fact, if you continue to walk this out, this oscillation will continue to grow. Um, and in the frequency domain, we can look over here and see that, yes, this is at just about exactly the same frequency in the drain that the driving point in minutes um, computation uh, predicted that it would be. So th these metrics aren't wrong. Um, they're just giving you different types of information. So if you didn't give up on the metric, you've learned something then. You, you've actually learned a, a pretty interesting thing, which is that for this configuration with these loads, um, I'll remove the feedback now, this circuit is technically stable. Um, now, the other thing that people uh, point out with K-factor, and that is true, is K factor sort of covers the entire Smith chart. So there's nothing here just because you have a, a negative um, or a low value in this K factor. Um, it doesn't say that your circuit will absolutely oscillate. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, so, so it, but it's a coverage of the Smith chart. So we did the driving point admittance analysis. We did it under these single termination conditions. We did not, in fact, when we were looking at NDF and driving point uh, admittance, look at the entire Smith chart. And K factor covers the entire Smith chart, if you remember from school. Uh, so, so one thing that I wanted to show is, like, how do you how do you deal with that? And something that you'll see designers do pretty often, um, if they're designing these amplifiers, is is envelope, what's called envelope analysis, uh, particularly with like cellular PAs. I remember when designing cellular power amplifiers, 
Um, you know, these these specs go back to the days when people used to pull out the antenna from that. You can you can you know extend the antenna out of your phone, and uh, if someone broke it off, then the power amplifier would see like a you know a twenty to one visoir. And so there's we're, we're very used to in the cellular space and pull, load pulling the outside of the Smith chart to um, make sure that your circuit is stable under all those conditions. And that's really what an, an envelope type of analysis uh, does. So some people have have developed different loop gain um, envelope techniques where you compute loop gain. Problem with loop gain is, is like I said, you won't if you're in the wrong place, you won't see anything. You won't see any instability. Um, and some of the loop gain techniques are quite crude. crude. So what I can do using the probes, though, um, and this is something um, this is something relatively new, is I can I can virtually derive an envelope. Uh, I can virtually load pull this because I have the Y matrix and, and generate a synthetic set of driving point uh, impedance curves. And then I can analyze all of those curves. Again, this is a rigorous metric. It goes back to Bode. I can analyze all those curves and determine if any of those curves meet the Kurokawa condition. So I've got a function here to do that. Uh, it's called H0 envelope. And I'm going to use three probes. Basically, I start, this is the input termination probe. So this is like the source, you know, gamma S. Over here, the drain, that's gamma L, that's the load. And, in, and inside the device, I have probes. I can pick any probe in this device. Um, so with those three inputs to the equation, I can compute the driving point at minutes. And then I just pass these loads in. Um, so I'm computing this driving point at minutes envelope. And from the driving point at minutes envelope, what I'm actually going to do, so it's running through, I think I have a bunch, kind of a bunch of curves. It's running through this family of curves. And it's identifying two of these curves inside of the Smith chart, which are unstable. And, uh, you know, like just to verify that, I suppose I could go back and, and change the load. But the point I'm making here is that if you're looking at K-factor, this actually doesn't disagree with K-factor at all. K-factor never said that at 50 ohms or, or 100 ohm ideal termination, this circuit would be unstable. The K-factor implies um, over the entire Smith chart that there could be areas where your circuit is potentially unstable. And that's a very important distinction to uh, point out. So I, I thought I'd go through and just... I'll try to type in this load manually if I can remember it, 8.7 and J120. Okay, so let's let's go here and type 8.7 plus J times 120 ohms. And when I run this, I'm, I'm really just trying to prove to you that even though I synthetically derived that using the probes, if I go back to the original S parameter simulation, you know, voila, we see driving point, um, Kurokawa driving point in minutes terms. That's what these mean. These are the frequencies that are unstable. So the probe was able to predict without actually load pulling the circuit or source pulling for that matter, the Kurokawa um, oscillations. Okay, so that's my first demo. Um, the second demo I have is, and, and I'm gonna have a little bit, um, this will be a little bit more brief, uh, mainly because I've, I've shown this in, in the YouTube video. Um, and I think that uh, you, can, you can go watch the YouTube video uh, on the channel if you want more information. But essentially what I want to show here is I, I think is a pretty novel technique. I haven't seen um, anyone else show this technique before to combine the, the probe metrics that we have with EM analysis to find the source of instabilities. So I've got this gallium nitride um, a power amplifier. This is based on a device from Corvo and a monolithics model. I can't go in and do a normalized determinant in the monolithics model because I can't turn off the source. That's extremely common. Um, and basically, what, what, I, what do I do? I build an EM structure. So I built an EM structure, and I ran, you know, I put the EM in, and I found that the circuit was unstable with that EM. So let me see if I can find um, what happened. So first, I, I look at the K factor. I see some, some you know, potential problem areas. Um, I'm looking at the Atomo loop gain now. So now, um, before, I couldn't really have a global uh, rigorous analysis of the, um, the stability of the network. Uh, if, I, if I didn't have access to the intrinsics. But now with the Tomo's method, the bifurcation method, I can go in and look at that, and it shows that this is unstable. Driving point admittance on the gate and drain nodes shows a set of uh, oscillations, one below the carrier frequency, this is at one gigahertz, and another above the carrier frequency. And you can start analyzing the loop gain. You see there's gain spikes in this area. You can, you can analyze it forward, backwards. You can figure out which direction from these loop gains the signal's flowing. Um, it's, this is kind of a trivial example, but it's flowing from the drain, of course, to the gate. But in other cases, you may find that the, um, the, the, the signal is traveling in the opposite direction. So you can detect with this method sort of feed forward oscillations. Um, OK, so in the analysis, um, well, essentially what I do is I take this circuit, this unstable circuit, and I, I do it a little different simulation. Instead of an, a harmonic balance simulation, I run an AC simulation. So I just ring this circuit with an AC signal at the input and just hit all the nodes with some kind of 
of voltage. And I'm hoping that at all the frequencies, enough signal leaks through. You know, most of it bounces off the input, but I'm hoping that at some frequencies, some of this signal will get in here and stimulate for me a similar oscillation condition. Um, so let's see if I can find my unstable. So here's my layout. And from my layout, I can launch our EM tool in Advanced Design System, which is called RF Pro. So RF Pro will snapshot my layout, and it's going to allow me to perform the EM analysis. So I performed an EM analysis on this entire board. It's a pretty simple board here. Um, but now what I can do in RF Pro is I can actually go in and start um, looking at some current densities in RF Pro. So I'm going to plot here the near field um, result. I'll turn off these arrows. Um, because I think it looks a little nicer, it's easier to see. And so I can stimulate any one of these ports that I have. But the more interesting thing, I think, is that you can actually, I can use that AC analysis that I did and excite the circuit. And that's pretty cool, because now I can look, um, you know, with my, uh, let's see, so here I did this AC sweep, I did it this morning. Um, it's a pretty quick analysis. And now what I'm seeing is the way that the circuit itself is actually exciting the physical EM structure. I'm going to change the scale a little bit. So I'm, I'm down here. Well, first of all, um, let's go down. Let's go up to the transmit frequency. This is one gigahertz. So the transmit frequency. These are DC terms. They're blocking the signal, um, and here's the AC, and everything is going through the amplifier. So that's cool. Um, down at low frequencies. Remember, there was a low frequency oscillation. We saw it in our um, our Curacao oscillation condition. You can see where the board lights up. This is actually the bias line ground. So my bypassing ground signals coupling through here. If I, I need to separate these these um, two bias lines from each other, and that's going to improve the, um, the stability of the system. Go up above the transmit frequency. It's, a, it's not coupling now anymore through the bias line. The coupling that I'm experiencing that's causing my instability is very clear here. It's coming through the ground from the output to the input. So two different oscillations and two different causes for the oscillation. And with this type of EM and circuit co-analysis, you can very easily, very quickly get to the bottom of, of these kinds of problems. OK, so those were my, my two demos for today. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully come back to the, um, to the media player here. I just want to give a closing slide, and we could take some Q&A. So um, hopefully I've showed you that this, this Winslow probe is a new way to simplify stability analysis. I really hope if you want to learn more, go watch the, uh, the YouTube series and definitely download the uh, workspace. Uh, I got a whole bunch of papers if, you're, if you want to read a lot of papers on stability. So uh, here is a question um, from Nathan. He asked, can the WS probe completely replace the legacy WS probe? Legacy S probe, I assume you mean. Um, yes. So essentially, the, the, um, what he's referring to is there's an, there's an old probe. It's been around for a while. It goes back to uh, Campbell and Brown, um, this classic analysis. There's great white papers um, on it. And it's this S probe. And so um, this S probe is something that is in all the design tools. And yes, the, the WS probe is really not like a completely new concept. The WS probe is an adjustment of that original S probe to make it accurate in the presence of, feed, of arbitrary feedback. So yes, it will give you, uh, for cases where there's no feedback, you'll get an answer that's exactly the same as the S probe. But and I show an example in one of the videos in the workspace. You can go see it for yourself. If you put some feedback around the S probe, you start to see results that get to be nonsense. Um, and when you look at the WS probe under the same conditions, those results are now are accurate. And that's that's why we can use it so um, accurately for stability as opposed to the, the previous S probe. So the short answer is yes, you can replace it. OK, good. And here's a question. I'm not sure if you have enough time to talk about this one. Uh, Sharir asked, uh, would you talk a bit about subharmonic stability? Is there any way to simulate that? Yeah, the probes can detect um, subharmonic oscillations. I um, I can probably provide, I, I'm looking at the time, I think I could probably talk about this for like a half an hour, but the short answer is yes, you can detect a more detailed answer on, on exactly how to do that. The, the most common subharmonic oscillation is like a diode will produce a uh, you know, half term, half harmonic term, typically. So um, there, there are there are ways to do it. And remember, I mean, it's not the the probe itself is just giving you access to stability analysis techniques. So it's not really to me. It's not like does the probe do or not do something. It's really like does the technique itself detect the the uh, the oscillation? And the yeah, short answer is yes. There are techniques to detect that. And here is a question from Giorgi. 
Is there a video or webinar that uses the WS analysis, but for an oscillator design, specifically in terms of integrated ASIC, LC, and CMOS or similar? Yeah, I mean, of course, this stuff could apply directly. I don't know if there's, well, I haven't made a webinar about it. I don't know if like Andy <laughs> Howard might make a, <laughs> he's, a, he's an oscillator <laughs> designer. I'm an amplifier designer. He's an oscillator designer. So I try to make uh, amplifiers that don't oscillate, and he tries to make oscillators that don't amplify. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, you can, of course, the, these techniques, in fact, like the OS, OS test you're probably familiar with, that is an, a, an old school um, oscillator design technique. Uh, I'm not aware of any webinars on that, but certainly the, the techniques are completely applicable to, uh, to both cases. Yeah, oscillators yeah. and amplifiers. Thanks for attending today's Everything High Frequency. Circuit designers need to know about stability analysis. Now you know. And uh, brought to you by Keysight Technologies. Please visit us at www.keysight.com forward slash find forward slash events. And uh, stay well. Be good. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.